Alright. Hello everyone. How are you? Sunny day. My name is Urs Gasser. I'm the executive director of the Berkman Klein Center. And I'm uh, really delighted to be the host of the Berkman Klein Meet the Author series. <laughs> That's the first edition of it. And you know, the idea came uh, while I was um, sick actually last year and reading lots of books. And then um, there were these books that you read with great benefit and insight. Uh, and then you put them back into the bookshelf. Um, and then there are the books where you're like, you know what, I would love to meet the author and have a conversation. And I'm really, really delighted that our guest, special guest today, Farah Pandit, accepted the invitation after I read um, a draft <laughs> manuscript uh, of her book. Uh, it's really excellent. Uh, we'll, um, of course, talk more about it. And uh, uh, just by way of brief introduction, uh, Farah Pandit is a uh, esteemed colleague, uh, a friend and collaborator, uh, wearing many different hats, having a, uh, an amazing career as a public servant, as a thought leader. Um, she currently has appointments as senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations uh, at the Kennedy School. She served um, uh, as a, a political appointee uh, for the Bush uh, administrations as well as the Obama administration. She was the first ever special representative uh, to the Muslim uh, communities appointed by Secretary uh, Clinton. Um, you have done, you have had an amazing <laughs> career already and uh, yet we're, we're here talking about um, your latest contribution, your book, How We Win. Um, you can see the nicer copy standing here. You can also purchase uh, the book um, outside. And uh, Farah, thank you so much for, for accepting the invitation for this conversation. This is as close to a fireside chat as we get here <laughs> at Harvard Law School. Although there's an actual fireplace downstairs, so I was uh, tempted to switch locations. That would have been fun, actually, yes, but yes. this is great. Um, so when we scheduled um, this conversation, uh, we had no idea that uh, um, you know, we would uh, soon have another big uh, tragic um, attack in, in New Zealand 10 days ago. And I thought just to start as we are talking about extremism and uh, what to do about it and against it, uh, I was wondering whether you would be willing to share what's on your mind um, 10 days after um, Christchurch. Well, thank you so much. And, and before I respond, because that's a really important question, uh, I do want to thank all of you for taking time during your lunch uh, to have a conversation with us. Uh, but Urs, I also want to thank you so much. Uh, he sort of glossed over this. And for those of you who have not yet read the book, you will see him in the book, because uh, he was an early colleague, along with John Palfrey, um, who, when I reached out and asked for assistance, uh, just said, how can we help? This is such an important question. So we've been working together since 2007. Um, I think even before that, actually, when I was at the White House. Uh, so I want to thank you for your incredible partnership and, and, um, and friendship all these years. And it's a joy to be sitting with you talking about this book, because we've been working on it together mm -hmm. in some way, shape, or form, um, as I have gone back and forth with you for many years. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, yeah, this is, this is a very sobering moment. Uh, what's on my mind? I, I'm, um, it's another reminder of an opportunity where humanity can come together. Uh, and it's demonstrated some extraordinary uh, light uh, when you see the response from the prime minister in New Zealand. What is capable if you choose to lead? Um, how you can bring societies together. You see the very best uh, in, in the very worst of times. And, and I say it's sobering because it's so rare to see that. And so what's on my mind today as I, as I reflect 10 days out is um, with the devastation uh, emotionally and uh, spiritually uh, and certainly the loss of life, uh, I think to myself uh, yet again uh, why we are finding ourselves in a situation where we have to respond to these things when there are opportunities for us to do more even in our daily lives. So I'm in a very um, serious moment uh, as I reflect 10 days out. 
thank you for sharing for sharing that and and some of the themes you already introduced, including the role of leadership and uh, we haven't mentioned technology yet. Okay. We'll return to that too. Of course, are are very much um, themes of your book uh, that we want to talk about. Um, so this book addresses the question um, of extremism, uh, of uh, ways how to counter, especially violent extremism, and it provided an incredible framework for me to better understand what's happening in the world. So so thank you for writing this thank book. You. Um, we'll, we'll introduce some of the elements as, as, as we go forward. Um, at the same time, I also felt it's a very personal book. I've learned a lot about you that I didn't know before. Um, Farah traveled uh, more than 80 countries um, over the past decade or so. Um, I've learned uh, about your um, origin, about your um, growing up here as a Muslim woman in, in Massachusetts, yes. about your experiences. Uh, your mom was introduced <laughs> too in one of the chapters and it's delightful to have her here today as well. So I was wondering as this is some sort of also a very personal story, what motivated you to write down that story and what you have done uh, wearing these various hats and in different positions in the government but also working with civil society institutions? Urs, as you know, this is my first book. Uh, I think if anybody had told me that it was going to be <laughs> the experience that it was, I don't know if I would have been able to think through a three-year process the, the way, I mean, because it took a very long time for me to get out what, I, what was inside of me uh, in a way that I thought people could understand. So there were two motiva motivating factors. Um, the first was how extraordinary it was and how lucky I was to be able to serve a country that I care so much about for both Republicans and Democrats at a time when our country is being pulled apart on these red-blue issues when the issue that I've been looking at is, doesn't have a color, it is a human issue. So I wanted to be able to articulate to the reader that uh, as somebody who was so privileged to be able to serve this country in the years after the devastating attacks of 9-11, I felt it was my responsibility to tell a story of what it is I saw inside of government, what both President Bush and President Obama were thinking about um, through my eyes uh, on how do we stop recruitment from happening. Could have told many other stories about the things that I saw in government, but this wasn't a story that was covered very much. And people tended to gloss over uh, this, the soft power piece of the, of the story. So I felt listen, I, I lived it, I experienced it, there is no other political appointee in our government ever who has all this knowledge, has, because I've seen it, I've experienced it, I had to be able to tell this in a way um, to open up uh, the conversation in a new way because it was very faulty. But then the other side was also um, really very important and serious. My last day of government was on a Friday in 2014, uh, and I left DC and over the weekend came to Cambridge, where on Monday I started at the Institute of Politics uh, as a Spring Fellow. And in the context of this, I tell you this because I was also lucky enough to be around colleagues where I was saying, you know, I had just come out, I had served in government, all of whom said, tell us your story. You know, tell us what you saw. I was like, well, nobody wants to hear about me going here and there and everywhere. I was thinking very, very much the, poli the, the policy wonky kind of stuff. Like, this is what was happening in the interagency. This is, but through my conversations with my colleagues at the, at the Kennedy School, more and more people, and by the way, including you, because we had many conversations about how do you tell this story, it was also you need to show a part of yourself and take the reader with you on this journey so they could see you. And as I began to do that, I recognized I'm a pretty private person when it comes to my own family. I didn't, I didn't want to expose the world to things that were, that were extremely private to me, but I thought there's no way I could get the kind of credibility and legitimacy from the reader if they didn't understand who I was. So I did expose a little bit more about myself than I normally would. And if I may ask an additional question in the same zone, um, in the book, uh, I was, what stood out to me is, uh, 
you basically feature conversations and the voices of many thousands of people you've talked to uh, during uh, you know, your, the time um, and different jobs and um, different contents. Um, and to give, to give voice to people, I thought that that stood out. And the other thing that stood out is really, you call it um, nano-intervention. So we will talk in just a few minutes about some of the big ecosystem level systemic uh, issues that lead to this um, crisis that, that we uh, started with um, and started uh, to describe. But there is also this several moments in the book, there are human moments where, where we as individuals can make a change and make the world a kinder, a better place and frankly um, push back against uh, extremism. And I was wondering whether you could just share one or two stories how we as individuals can, can uh, be part of the solution and not part of the problem. That's, I think, the most important part of the book uh, because we tend to think about things like extremism. It's scary. I mean, let's get real. I mean, our, it's a really scary topic. Terrorism is really frightening. Um, some of the people in this room may have lost people. Um, we're almost at the anniversary of the Boston bombing. It's a very emotional thing that we, that we deal with. And often we want somebody else to handle that problem for us. Uh, law enforcement or policymakers in Washington that can surely do something that's going to stop the problem. But the thing that was extraordinary for me from 2003 when I came back into government all the way to when I left in 2014, repeatedly, I would see that it was the intervention one-on-one -on -one that would change a person's mind about a particular issue, whether it was race or religion, whether it was sexuality or gender, that individual conversation. Um, walking in somebody else's shoes, we always hear about. What we never talk about is this skill of listening, of conversing, that you can actually have a very different opinion than somebody else. But there's a way in which you can talk about it with the other person. We used to have a world <laughs> where you could have those conversations and, and not feel threatened by them. You are energized by them. What I wanted to be able to do was to say to everyone that you know, you, you don't always have to win in your, in your argument. You can actually open up the human dimension of your, of your experience and ask questions about why somebody does something. What's the motivation behind that thing? So, for example, um, when you hear and you see something terrible happening to another human being, I mean, I feel like this is the stuff you learn at your dining room table from your parents, so forgive me for saying this because this is so obvious. Being kind and being compassionate to the person who um, may be going through something or may, may not understand something fully um, has actually made a difference to people who have been at that breaking point where people, they thought that they were on the outside. So someone would say to somebody, why don't you eat pork, for example? Um, and instead of saying, I can't believe you're not eating pork, you know, you're in this country, eat pork, you might want to say, so tell me about your, 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 why don't you eat pork? And oh, it's a religious thing. And, and, and the way in which you converse, that change in tone, that sounds so simplistic. But that one-on-one -on -one kind of thing, that, that way in which you act as a human, as opposed to acting as somebody who is a forceful uh, entity that is pulling somebody down, that compassion that you have. I have gone to cities in America where Louisville, Kentucky comes to mind, where the mayor, uh, Mayor Fisher, um, made Louisville a city of compassion because he wanted to be able to say, here in this city, this is what we stand for. We're going to be kind and compassionate to each other. Um, and, and, and just even in our discourse, you may not always agree, but you can do it on a one-to-one -one level. So at its core, it's really debunking the us versus them ideology that is all around the, the, the ethos in which we live right now. It's understanding what it must be for that other person and try to bring them in, even if they are different, even if you don't agree with everything that they're saying, find a way to make it human again. It's not only the, uh, some sort of kindness, what you're describing is also a certain curiosity yes. to explore a diverse world that is interesting and fascinating and very rich and celebrate the diversity as well. So uh, 
I mentioned it's a book, and I really recommend, recommend it strongly, um, uh, of, of, of narratives, of stories. Um, but you do more than storytelling. You, you combine these voices um, that you've collected around the globe, and you weave it together in, in also kind of an analytical framework that um, really uh, helps me and the reader to understand um, how we've ended up in a world where extremism dominates uh, the headlines uh, and what we can do about it. And so uh, in my own some sort of mind map that I, I drew, um, there are like four, roughly four components to the framework you've outlined. The one that I um, was eye-opening is, is this argument um, that especially young Muslim, young people um, are growing up in a post 9-11 world um, and actually find themselves in, in a moment of an identity crisis. Uh, and I would love to hear you expand uh, on that. A second uh, factor of influence, both to explain what is happening, what are the dynamics when it comes to extremism, but also how we uh, can counter it, is more the, the strategic push by certain actors and frankly, you know, certain communities and countries even uh, to spread uh, extreme ideology. Um, and then the third, some sort of cluster, and I hope we can uh, focus on that also a little bit given that we're at the Berkman Klein Center, focuses on uh, what you call Shaikh Google, the role of social media and technology, but also in an interesting way blending it uh, into the consumer space, what uh, you describe as halalization of everyday uh, practices, again, uh, with a focus on young people. Um, and then lastly, um, the, the fourth kind of cluster on my personal mind map reading your book of your framework is uh, some sort of the rise of uh, anti-Americanism and the anti-Americanism um, ideology. Um, I hope I do roughly justice you to your really framework. Well. <laughs> uh, I, I clearly read the book. Um, but if we can maybe spend a little bit more time talking about this notion of, of a um, identity crisis, both at the individual level, but m maybe also at the collective and cultural level uh, among young people who then uh, create some sort of a vacuum uh, and may lead to, to really terrible outcomes. What I uh, thought was very important was that uh, we actually take a look at the kind of extremism that I was asked to deal with. And so let me just take a step back to make sure that um, you are clear we're all on the same page here. Uh, obviously, there are many different types of extremism um, that, is, that are present in our world today. The us versus them ideology is the commonality across these ideologies. But the type of ideology that I was dealing with directly connects to terrorist organizations that use the name of Islam to prey upon young people to pull them into their armies, okay? I obviously am not making a statement about the religion of Islam. I am talking about terrorist organizations that are manipulating religion for their nefarious ends. I just want to be very clear about that. I also want to be very clear about the fact that every young person, all of us, I sometimes still go through this myself, ask the question, who am I? What am I, what am I supposed to be doing here? What's the meaning of life? Everybody goes through this, you know, uh, and um, there's nothing peculiar about it. You know, it's not about your religion or your race or your heritage. It's, it's, that's part of growing up. The human mind does not mature. The brain does not mature until the age of 24. There are lots of things that are happening to you along the way. But when 9-11 happened, something remarkably new came forward, and that is a consciousness globally of this terrorist organization called Al-Qaeda, whose frame about us versus them was, was built around um, America, this is what we think you are, this is what we believe that you are doing uh, against Muslims, and it was to say to, to young Muslims around the world, we wanna tell you what it means to really be a Muslim. Okay, so they're doing, those two forces are pushing out. At the very same time, the young kids are growing up 
with the word Islam or Muslim on the front pages of papers online and offline every single day since September 12, 2001. That is stunning. And it's a huge change. And, and, and when you think about that demographic, there, one fourth of the planet is Muslim, 1.6 billion people. One billion of those are young kids under the age of 30, young people under the age of 30. That's the demographic from which the bad guys are recruiting. So the numbers are huge. And it is not to say that every young person under the age of 30 who happens to be Muslim is a, is a potential terrorist, obviously not. But the bad guys want them to believe that they are the arbiters of what it means to be Muslim. And the only way that they can actually develop that if, is if they understand that this is happening, what's happening. For these kids who have grown up post 9-11, who are trying to deal with this navigation of who am I, they are seeing a fierce attention all the time on the fact that they're Muslim. It, it is a post 9-11 phenomenon. There's nowhere you can go where you can look away and pretend you're not Muslim. You have a weird name. You look a particular way. You're experiencing your life with people that you had always known suddenly looking at you differently. Parents having to go to their schools to pick up their kids whose 11-year-old child, I mean, I had a conversation with a parent who's telling me that their teacher is asking their 11-year-old kid in the class, please explain what, uh, who Osama bin Laden is and why Muslims uh, like him. I mean, are you kidding me? So these kinds of things are happening all day, every day, to a generation that's huge. And it's glo obviously global. Muslims are all over the world. And at the very same time that this is happening, where there's fierce attention, they're going through, they're growing up at a, at, at, as adolescents, as young people. They're asking really important questions about the difference between culture and religion. They're having a hyper uh, experience about sort of Muslimness. The bad guys know that they're going through this, and so what are they providing? They're providing ready-made answers that make sense in peer-friendly ways so that they're, they have to build their armies. That's what their job is. They don't want to just sit around doing their thing. They can't do what they do unless they have armies. So you're going to go after vulnerable young people who are going through an identity crisis, and they're delivering those messages online and offline in ways that we could never keep up with. OK, that's a different question about how do we solve it. So I'll just stop there. But that's the identity crisis. They're having it. The bad guys know that they're having it. They're delivering uh, answers to those bad guys through what I call shake Google, OK? Because they're going to the thing that's the easiest manifestation of an answer. So let me just make this clear to you. You all remember the underwear bomber? You guys remember that guy? He was born in Nigeria. He came from an affluent family. He was studying in the UK. He goes online and he asks Sheikh Google, why doesn't my family eat halal meat? Now, those of you in this room know that halal is similar to kosher. It's a very particular way uh, you, uh, you kill an animal so you can eat the meat that way. So he's not asking his mom and his dad He's not asking his cousins, his sisters, his brothers, why in our family don't we eat halal meat? He's asking Sheikh Google. And what does Sheikh Google say? Your family's not religious. Come to me. Let me show you how to be religious. You go through Sheikh Google, you end up on the other side talking to a bad guy. So it is, um, it's, pretty, it's pretty smart of the bad guys to be doing this. They understand because they too are of the same pure generation. They know what's happening. I urge us all to think about this idea of all day, every day, seeing the word Islam on papers, online and offline. It's made a difference even for the strongest, bravest, most courageous humans. It is hard. It is hard to navigate that identity piece when all of this is happening around you. So we have what's the system. One of the pieces of the most essential form of the system is that one billion experience of young people under the age of 30 that was stunning to me because I used to think, OK, this is maybe only the kids in the first world, or this is somebody, it's, you know, it's happening in London, and it might be happening in New York. But surely it's not happening in Suriname. Surely it's not happening in Malaysia. Surely it's not happening in Tajikistan. But guess what? Across the world, that is the one data point. Muslims in Muslim-majority countries and Muslims that lived as minorities 
who were under the age of 30 all had that thing going for them. So that's the essential part. The mechanism, the tools to deliver the messages of the bad guys, what was actually existing are part of the system as well. I talked about Shake Google. We'll talk more about technology, but that exists. So you're going to an alternative source for your own authenticity and your own belonging. Really important. What was also happening through that is this, this unbelievable fragility that was connected to identity. So these young people wanted to live their, like, you know, they wanted to show you that they were really Muslim, whatever that might mean, okay? But so how does that happen? It, it, it means that you're going to live Islam it, with like a lifestyle brand. That was also happening, I observed that. Weird, it was really weird to me that in cultures that were hundreds of years old, that people who dressed a very particular way suddenly were changing the way they dressed and they were dressing in ways that were connected to their peers in other parts of the world because they all wanted to be Muslim whatever that meant. And so I say in the book, you know, it's like the, it's like, uh, forgive me for those people who have um, Fitbits on, okay. All, so, not, some of you will really be athletic with your Fitbits. Some of you, I know, are wearing the Fitbit because you want to tell people that you're really athletic, right? So you kind of have this thing that you put on to say, look at me, look, look, at, look at what I am. And I was seeing that happen with, with young Muslims, that they were, it wasn't about their religiosity, it was about, this idea that they had to sell to their peers, look, I'm doing it the right way. So for example, th I call this halalization, in the, in the, that's what you were talking about. Um, there was a guy that I met in New Zealand who was selling halal water. Now, there is no such thing as halal water, okay? But people were buying it. They were buying the halal water because they wanted to be able to show you like, look, look, look at the water I'm drinking. Look at the scarf I'm wearing. Look at the shoes I've decided to buy. Look at the vacation I'm going on. Look at the everything is all about this world that I want to live in that is demonstrating a religion out loud. So all of this is going on. So then there's the, the It's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. There are two other parts of the system that, that we know are underlying, I, I experience underlying. So across the world, um, in a chapter that I call America the Boogeyman, um, there is this sort of question that all of you read and heard, and I'm going to pop the balloon for you because this is the wrong question to ask. Why do they hate us? Okay, it really is the wrong question. It's not about that. But the forces of, of, of the bad guys are putting out there what, what they say America is. And so whatever it is we do, no matter what we do, they take what we do and they manipulate it in such a way that it comes out the other side in a really terrible way. So I, you know, it is as silly as things like, I remember being at the National Security Council, and I, I mean, I thought it was a joke. I mean, I just couldn't believe it. So there was a tsunami in uh, Indonesia, a really horrible one, uh, and um, well, as if tsunamis could ever be good, but a really bad one. Uh, and we were getting information that the bad guys were actually saying that we actually started the tsunami as if we had like sort of the weather switch in the White House. I wish we did, we don't. Um, we don't, really, we don't. Um, and, but it's sort of anything that could happen, America did it, it's bad, you know? And that kind of, it wasn't just about foreign policy, it wasn't just about our, the wars in Iraq or Afghanistan or Pakistan. It wasn't just about how we felt about Israel Powell. It wasn't, it wasn't about the things that you would imagine it to be. It was all the other stuff on the inside as well. So that is another plank. And then the final, and uh, for those of you who read foreign policy, they just did an excerpt on Sunday yesterday from this chapter that I call Plague from the Gulf. Um, and it, the most essential thing outside of the identity crisis that I discovered in the work that I did in all of these countries was that there was a decade long, decades long uh, effort on, on behalf of Saudi Arabia to indoctrinate their view of the world into countries all over the world to tell people how to be a particular kind of Muslim. Now, it is very important that you understand that I take no position at all about how to live your religion out loud. I don't care if you cover or don't cover. I don't care what kind of Muslim you call yourself. I don't care. That's not my thing. It's not, it's, that's not why I wrote this book. 
simply telling you that for three to four decades, Saudi Arabia has spent billions of dollars making sure that the world only understands that the only way to be Muslim is their way. And the reason why that is problematic for the problem we're trying to solve is because their very strict interpretation, not just of gender roles, not just of what is right and what is wrong, but the way in which you're supposed to interpret the Quran and interpret your daily life uh, impacts an us versus them ideology because it is all about us versus them ideology. So I would see, for example, uh, Saudi Arabia, and these are things you guys read about in the press, you know about textbooks that have been funded by Saudi Arabia to, to teach a very particular thing that are sent for free all over the world. The US State Department has written about this in our human rights reports. You guys have seen this. You also know about the translations of Qurans that are translated in a very particular way to make sure that anything that has nuance is scrubbed. Um, and I go into a lot of detail in the book about this. Another method, another tactic the Saudis have used is to put money into communities all over the world to pay people to dress a very particular way. Um, and in addition to that, uh, they have enforced around the world um, a scrubbing, like Hitler did, a scrubbing of cultural history. So that isn't just a Muslim thing, that is a human thing. We want as much historical data in our world as we can to remember who we are as humans, where we came from. They've gone into countries and decimated ancient sites and rebuilt them um, to be extremely, uh, either to eradicate them or to replace them with uh, a Wahhabi interpretation of that mosque or that particular thing. All of these things are part of the system that they've designed to be able to spread what they're doing. So when I write about all these things in the book, it's not one thing or the other or the other. It's how all of these forces build together to create the system that is underlying extremism. And it's the, it's the situation we face today. Great summary and, and really helpful, I think, uh, for everyone, also for those who may not read all the 500 pages. <laughs> um, but um, what you're describing suggests the headlines we're reading today uh, about extremism, about the violence, uh, about the role of technology is actually, that's a complex interplay uh, across these factors. And it's been in the making for a long time time, arguably, right? right? And so it sounds very much like an ecosystem level problem you're describing. There are, you know, the role of governments, there are technology companies, there are identity, individuals, cultural, religious identity questions at play. So what happened that governments in Europe and in the US, as you describe in the book, haven't really identified the challenges ahead 10, 15 years ago. I mean, you, you identified these trends and challenges, but what happened that we didn't you know, get ahead of, of these developments uh, as they have been in the making for a while and it was not some sort of a one incident here or there, but really a, a system level combination of, of factors that came together in a perfect storm kind of way. One of the things that government is, um, hard pressed to do is to imagine. We don't like to imagine the worst. We don't like to imagine. There are parts of our government whose job it is to only imagine. But the vast number of people within the interagency aren't sitting around going, if I'm a bad guy, what's the worst thing that I could do? And then we build the system for that. And we need to do that because they are doing it. I mean, you're reading one-offs on Osama bin Laden's son, Hamza, who's 30 years old, who is a peer-friendly actor for certain components of the people who will be lured in. We should, be, we, have, we should have already imagined him on the planet and the things that he could be doing. Um, so one of the problems that we, we face is this lack of imagination of what's, what's the worst. We didn't imagine that ISIS could exist. You know, one could see the beginning signs when we only look at the crisis we face by looking at the physical manifestations of war, 
the ideological manifestations of war become something that's on the side. Government doesn't do soft power, uh, sort of ideology, emotion stuff very well. Our soft power bucket is around diplomacy, it's around sanctions, it's around, I mean, or, sorry, the coercion systems that happen in hard and soft power. We look at them in a very particular way. Um, what, what I would say to you is if you don't, if you only look at a particular region of the world and think your understanding, let's for example suggest the Middle East or Afghanistan, Pakistan, and you say those are the two most serious things because we know we have terrorist groups over there and we're going to look at them, you forget everything else because that's not a quote priority. What I saw in traveling a special representative is you had to connect what you were seeing in Guyana, to what you were seeing in Canada, to what you were seeing in Fas du Gassou, what we were seeing, you would start, you have to start building that global map of the trends and this and the things that were happening within the system so you could see the entire problem and solve for that as opposed to the whack-a-mole kind of thing that we're doing. We're doing a little bit over there and a little bit over there. So we didn't, we didn't connect the dots. We had nobody in government, we still do not have anybody in government who wakes up every day and does what the chairman of the Joint Chiefs does. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs wakes up every day is responsible for the physical component of the defense of our country. That person knows where every troop is, where every drone is, where every satellite is, I mean, we could go on. And they know how to use it. Nobody in the Bush administration, nobody in the Obama administration, and nobody in the Trump administration wakes up every day and says, what are all the tools in our soft power arsenal? How many more do we need? How do we deploy them? How do we build the antibodies within our communities to make sure the bad guys can't recruit? We, in every national security strategy from 2006 until the one Trump just did, talks about the ideological war. Let's remember that in 2006, President Bush said we have a battle of arms and we have a battle of ideas. This battle of ideas has not received the kind of money or attention that it needs. You can't stop recruitment if you don't have, if you can't deploy the countermeasures to make sure that the bad guys aren't getting ahead of you. Wow. So that's why we are where we are. Wow. So uh, before we switch towards some sort of the solution space, your book title is uh, How We Win and throughout at the chapters you have a, you introduce lots of ideas and suggestions and actually a roadmap of what can be done to counter extremist, um, uh, violent uh, extremism. Before we turn to that, I wanted to open up for a few questions uh, from the audience, uh, perhaps staying a little bit within the problem description that we introduced or uh, maybe, you know, if you want to, to learn more about some of the stories uh, far already introduced. So um, if, if anyone has comments as well, <laughs> of course, not only questions. Yes, please, over here. And there is a mic, sorry, if, and please introduce yourself briefly if you don't mind. Oh, my name is Melissa Davey. I, I was just going to ask when you said you admired the approach of the Prime Minister of New Zealand, and um, that's not about Islamic terrorism, but it's about the us-them mentality, and in a way there's some reaction to Islamic terrorism and that man's behavior. I mean, we haven't seen his manifesto, most of us, but do you agree with what she's doing in terms of saying, I'm not going to mention his name. Let's not talk about what he said. Let's look at the victims. Or do you think it's better to actually study and share all the information about him in order to solve, work on solving this problem? It's a really important question. So let me talk about that in a, and I'm getting, I will get it to where you asked that question. So I'm gonna sound like I'm not, but I promise I'm coming back to you. Um, when I was in government, one of the things that we like to do is to opine on lexicon uh, and really think through how we're going to say something. Is this the right way of saying it? We spend a lot of time and energy on these kinds of things. We don't spend uh, as much time, nor did we, on some things that sort of shot up uh, uh, along the way. Geert Wilders is one example. I can come up with a few others of uh, horrible events that happened and we, want, we gave a lot of agency to those people. Um, one of the people, and I'm not gonna mention his name, um, this story, ha this, this is in the book, so I'm, I'm telling you a story from the book, but I think it is important. When I was in Cambodia, 
uh, I was, uh, I went to go see a Muslim community outside of Phnom Penh. We, so we drove out into the jungle and I was, uh, I was there with my team embassy team. I don't speak the local language. I had a translator with me. We were sitting on the floor of a very modest mosque in a very, very modest small village. And um, you know, we're in the middle, I mean, there's jungle everywhere, okay? Somebody raised his hand. Uh, I called on that person. The question that they asked, and I'm not gonna name his name, was does blank represent America? The person that this person named by name, it had been three years since the story had broken. This is a pastor in Gainesville, Florida, who was going to burn a Quran. You guys remember the story? Okay, now you guys remember. I used to ask people, do you remember his name? And most of the time, people would not remember his name. They remember the story. And I used to give them his name. But I'm not giving his name anymore for the same reason. Giving somebody agency around that kind of power allows that person to actually thrive in ways that we don't even know because it takes on a life of itself, okay? We gave him time on CNN and other channels to tell his story, to do what he wanted to do. We gave him, uh, we gave him a platform. He had 50 people in his church. He was not, he did not represent America, obviously, but all these years later, these people in Cambodia believed that he did represent America because he was a force. We gave him a big platform. I don't know what will happen years from now. I don't know how the, the far right extremists will manipulate facts. We are, you know, Urs started this conversation by asking me how I feel and I told you I was reacting from this event. But hate is hate. And we're sitting here having conversations in America about which is the worst kind of hate. Is it the ones that come from the people in New Zealand? Or, I mean, whether it's Charleston or Christchurch, whether it's Boston or Bali, does it matter? Hate is hate. And we have bad guys that are out there destroying our communities and, and killing people based on an us versus them. And so for me, I will not give agency to those people who want fame, to be able to ignite more power because we have decided to keep telling that story over and over again with them front and center. But you ask something so important. It is important for us to learn from things like this. And there will be hundreds and hundreds of researchers who will be looking at that guy, who will be reading the manifesto, who will be unpacking and dissecting and connecting the dots. It doesn't mean that we need to see his name all day, every day, on TV and um, and on the internet because what that does for the bad guys who manipulate, and we, we can get to that in terms of how the bad guys are actually doing what they do, they are actually taking real life events and turning them to the way they want to do it. So they will take a president, a prime minister using that person's name and shape the narrative to suit them even though that person did not mean it that way. So I think it's wise of her to be as careful as she's being. We have another comment here. You knew I had to. I would expect Please it. introduce yourself. <laughs> uh, Stu Crusell, uh, Global Programs at MIT. And I mention that because we're here at Harvard. MIT, you've talked somewhat about how individuals can address this, but institutions, and especially institutions of higher learning, MIT's had a whole debate, should we take money from Saudi Arabia? I've got a meeting on Wednesday with some people from the UAE. Um, how do you approach engaging but not enabling? It's really um, the most critical question universities and companies are actually facing. We're, we're looking at, um, and, and I, really it's important to, to think about the subtitle in this book because I call out every sector of society to make a difference here. Not just government, um, but I look at the private sector, I look at philanthropists, I look at social media, um, because all these issues are, are intertwined. It's, it's, it's how we solve a problem. Uh, I think the question around money that comes from sources that are doing harm are, are fair questions to ask. But the next question becomes, can you control the money? What do you do with the money and how do you develop the antibodies in the system to prevent the thing that we, we know we can prevent? Some of the time, we can. Some of the time, you can take money from, from uh, from philanthropists who, who are 
are, uh, who've made their money in ways that were not always the most humanitarian, right? I mean, I don't want to call out particular sectors, but we could look at the energy or the oil sector, and people have these questions about would you take money from big oil? Would you take money from big tech now is a question that's happening because we know what, how they're manipulating human data to do what they're doing. Um, those are fair questions, but Stu, one of the things that I think is most important is sending a signal back to these countries. If you're taking money from a nation state, as Americans, the things that we stand for in terms of freedom of speech, human rights, all of these kinds of things that are no, there's no wiggle room whatsoever in terms of how we think about these things. We've got to be clear, I believe, to these countries about how we expect them to behave on these issues. And if they're taking money from those places, how your school is going to use them and what you're going to do with them will say a lot about what your school stands for. So that, that internal debate, I'm not exactly answering because I can't tell you what to do and how to do it because it, it really actually, I've seen different solutions come to the table um, around, around these issues. Some universities I know that have taken money from a Saudi or a UAE or a Qatar, but have absolute 100% uh, opportunity to use that money the way they want to use it. Um, and th there's, a way to, there's a way to be able to do that. They've also offered um, an opportunity for their students um, to be able to learn why this is such a difficult conversation. And so you have an educational component to that as well. It's a very fair question. It's a real question. And I think it's going to become an even more pressing question, um, not just from nation states, but also from, um, from companies who are, who are redesigning the way it feels to be a human. If I take one more question, please. <clears throat> Uh, George McCray, um, first a comment. Diane de Prima, the poet, wrote a, a, a poem called Rant. And one of the lines is, the only war that matters is the war against the imagination. All other wars are subsumed in it. Um, what's the relationship between Saudi Arabia, oil, Wahhabism, and terrorism? That is a really long question. Um, <laughs> And I and I there are many many scholars who have written uh, about the interplay of all of those three things, and have to your point about research done some very deep research around following the money. Uh, I would urge you to look at, the, uh, at FDD, the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, who's done a lot of work, um, and I'd urge you to look at David Weinberg, uh, at who is now at ADL, uh, the Anti Defamation League, who is. In, this, in my book, he's a friend, I, I say that to you, but he's also done uh, incredible work and has testified before our Congress on these very issues. So he's really, I mean, that, that's a starting point for you to be able to look at that. In a very loose answer, I would say to you, um, obviously you cannot do the kind of dramatic uh, strategy that they have deployed over decades without the money to be able to do it. And if you have an unlimited amount of money to be able to do this, it's connected to how they earned that money. Um, one of the questions that I want as a former US government um, public servant to, to be able to say to government is we have to be far more clear and direct with the American public about what we know we haven't done that, and I think it is vital that we tell a different kind of story because I think American parents who have servicemen and women uh, who are deployed around the world protecting our nation deserve to know more than they know today. It's a great, powerful segue into the question you know, of the roadmap, what's ahead, what can we do about it, and you already um, made a few important points about the role of governments, but also the role of philanthropy. We touched up on that. Um, perhaps we can spend a few minutes and, and, and look more closely at the role of, of technology yes. companies in particular. Uh, it's a topic we've talked a lot about in the past. So as much as we understand um, these platforms do a lot of good in the world, they enable <laughs> and empower people um, to, you know, share information and, and be connected across distance and um, are so vital in many ways to the uh, way we um, live our lives today. But 
also really bad things are happening. And uh, it's a moment of crisis, of course. Um, uh, one thing that I didn't say in the introduction is that you predicted in the book that before too long, it is very likely that we will witness live coverage over social media platforms of mass shootings. And sadly, you were right, um, even as the book was still in print. Uh, so what's the role of technology companies specifically in all that? What can we do? How can we help each other um, to make progress? So the platforms, um, the major ones, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Twitters, um, were obviously first to the fire when it came to us understanding how the bad guys could manipulate. Obviously today there are far more platforms that are being used by, let's remember, millennials and Generation Z are the demographic we are talking about. Okay, They are not being lured in online through um, ancient platforms. They are ahead of everything that government could ever do. Okay, They are right there. They are using platforms. They're using their imagination to use platforms. Um, so it's not just about a meme. It is not just about a particular hashtag. It is about the entire way in which um, the bad guys are using communication to lure in emotionally and pull on the strings that I just described. Um, this is not news to the companies, OK? So I would first say to you that while the technology companies have, in fact, invested some money by partnering with NGOs to work on really very small, but they have done it, pilot programs to try to see what we could do in an online space, and, and technology companies, to give them credit, have also hired people to look at this issue to try to do more, and to give them credit, have said, yes, we have more of a role to play. With all that great stuff that I just told you, I mean, what are they waiting for? I mean, truly. I, I will tell you that I, I am boggled by this thing. Facebook is one of the largest countries in the world. OK, they have to live through that. They have to understand what that means, just the way any country thinks about how their citizens act, why we do what we do. And I'm not talking about Uber regulating. I'm talking about what you stand for. What's the ethos of that thing? OK? Now, it took them a really long time, not just Facebook, but all the companies, to say, yes, we can do more. It's not that they didn't know the bad guys were using the platform. It took them a really long time to say, yes, we have a role to play in doing that. That took from a lot of pressure. It took all kinds of things. OK, so now they're doing it. The answer that you get from Facebook is that we have 10,000 people that are working on this one component takedown, which, by the way, important. And if you think that's the answer, it's not. But let's just pretend for just five seconds that that is going to do remarkable things immediately en masse. Takedown is something that we heard a lot about after the New Zealand thing. So they're saying they have 10,000 people who are doing this. Are you kidding me? It is one of the largest countries in the world. 10,000 people? That is nothing. OK? So one of the things that I get really frustrated by is don't tell me that you're doing something. Tell me the scale that you're doing it. Tell me how you're actually going to be able to offer a solution here with the kind of might and the kind of reach and the kind of innovation you have within your company. That requires leadership, and it requires commitment. And I have not seen the kind of forward-leaning, let's think out of the box, let's do something brand new, let's shake this whole thing up so we don't have this problem from the current leaders in the big tech companies. It just hasn't happened. I look and I talk about somebody named Paul Polson, uh, Paul Polson, excuse me, in the book, um, who's, who was head of uh, Unilever, gigantic company. How did he think differently to get the platforms of that company to do social good? I think of your audience as millennials and Generation Z. They are, in fact, demanding that companies do more. They have a different sense of social good. I think that the, the big tech companies are very late to the table. I don't want us to be only looking at 
if they would only do this and only do that, we'd have a problem, we'd have a, have a solution because as you rightly said, the bad guys are innovating in real time in ways that we can't catch up with. The bad guys can see the beginnings of change. We've got to imagine where we need to be and build for that, as I've said before. Um, and I just don't see that, I just don't see that happening. So the lack of leadership in that sense um, and call for more leadership to put it in positive terms, it seems at the core is also some sort of recognition of power and what the power um, is that you know, these platforms have de facto, whether they like it or not, now they have it. Um, and I want to maybe circle back on this notion of power. You, you um, introduced a very powerful concept, more looking at the public sector, but I feel it may also translate into you know, some of these discussions about the responsibility of big platforms. And that's the notion of open power. You already highlighted the idea of soft power and hard power in the conversation earlier on. Can, can, you, can you flesh out a little bit what, what this notion of open power is about as a potential approach and mindset of organizing these different pieces that need to be part of a movement as we uh, want to address um, this problem of extremism? One of the um, walls that I hit when I was in government was I felt like we didn't have enough uh, creativity and innovation in the way in which we were thinking about power. And, and let me be clear, I was not at the de Defense Department, I was at the State Department. So the, the, the thing that we do at State is diplomacy. It's soft power. You know what hard power is, you know what soft power is. Open power is a concept that I came up with which is really a derivative of soft power, okay? What it really says is, um, rather than wielding power over someone, you're it, open power is wielding power with others. And what government has not been able to do um, is to be able to think differently about how we win. Um, how do we get to the goal we want to get to? It requires us not to say, we did this, it's ours, it's the American flag, we, we're all over it, we've, we've orchestrated it. It's to say, we have a problem, and, and, and I outline different, different things that have to exist for the kind of problem that open power can solve. But one of the things it, is that you're putting different kinds of people around the table. To, it's more design thinking for, for human problems that we're dealing with in the, in the world of the State Department. Um, so things like human trafficking, things like climate change, things like um, extremism, where the only players there are not just diplomats, there are people that you would want to bring. I want to see historians. I want to see ethnographers. I want to see behavioral psych people. I want to see um, anthropologists sitting around the table with diplomats talking about how you would think about that problem if you were going to. So you're opening up the aperture. You're thinking about things in real time. You're not designing the solution for many years only, and you know we're working our way through to that point, you're figuring out that there is a longer framework you can use. You can get some results immediately, but you can also get some. So as you work with these teams in real time, this, you're, you're opening up what is possible. Um, and, and for me, that is the solution in the 21st century. You can't just we can't just keep looking at these problems and say we've always done it this way and so those are the only silos we can go through. Those are the only mechanisms we know how to do. You know, the revolution here is to say our planet is so connected, there are so much, there's so many incredibly interesting ideas that can be applied across the board even though you use that for one particular kind of problem that you think that there's no way that could be used for, for this, but actually the lessons that you learn here can be deployed in a different kind of way. So um, I was very keen on making sure that we were doing more uh, to, to solve the problems that I was seeing. Uh, I wish that state would be a place where we could experiment more boldly around how we use power. People talk about new power and smart power, and, and believe me, when I, when I came up with this, the first person I went to was Joe Nye, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, and asked him to help me think through this. Uh, and, and I feel very fortunate that he was very supportive and, and really saw the need for us to be able to do this do this differently, but it was at its, at its heart in a networked 
world the way we are living today, we have got to be able to think differently about how we get to the solutions that we really need for, for human reasons more than anything else, not about which country is going to win this or not. Um, we have to do something together. Thank you, Farah. The Thank book you. is full of wonderful <laughs> ideas, concrete suggestions, a lot of data, uh, a roadmap, uh, innovative new ways uh, how we can go after the, the issue. Um, but I have to ask you, you somewhere in the book, um, I think you wrote that you're an optimist. And after writing this book and, and spending so much energy over many years working on this hard, depressing, complex problem yes. where we haven't seen much progress in the right direction, are you truly still an optimist? And what, if so, makes you optimistic? I am an optimist, and I'm an optimist uh, because I've had tens of thousands of conversations with Muslim youth all over the world who are incredible, who don't want this ideology in their communities. They don't want foreign ideologies changing the way they behave and how they live. There are all kinds of incredible ideas, literally, from, from Mali to Malaysia. I mean, these kids are incredible, and I, I know that just the beginnings, we're just at the beginning of what could be possible if we knit together the networks of these young people to actually be able to scale their ideas. We will have to do very little. This isn't costing money. This is not a trillion, we've spent almost a six trillion dollars since 9-11, okay? Do you know how much money we've spent since the beginning of ISIS in soft power? 0.01 3.8% of the cost of what we've done to fight ISIS. Soft power doesn't cost the kind of money. It, it, it requires us to be imaginative. It requires us to say, how do I take that incredible idea that's over there, scale it? Or how do I get that young person to know that other young person and connect them? I am not Pollyanna, but I am somebody who has seen with, with little resources, what dedicated effort can do. I'm optimistic because the solutions are available and they are affordable. And what I hope will happen is as people read this book and hear me challenge communities to say, do you want to live in a place that's filled with hate or do you want to figure out what you can do in your house, in your school, in your city, in your town to actually make it a different place? What are the touch points in day-to-day -day life, you can change to make sure that hate is not thriving. There is stuff that you can be doing here. I am optimistic. I believe in the human spirit. And I believe most essentially, I mean, Stu said it, here we are. We're so privileged to be sitting here at Harvard in, and, and even more privileged to be in the Boston area with so many extraordinary schools filled with students from all over the world who all have experienced extremism. Why isn't Boston the hub of innovation around fighting hate? I don't understand. And I've called on this. I said this in a Boston Globe op-ed. I called it Dumbledore's Army. That's a whole other question. But, but, but the point is, um, I need to see um, the kind of leadership from people who can help build the powerful ideas. That's the, that is the roadblock, but the ideas are there. So I'm, that's why I'm optimistic, yes. Wonderful. Farah, thank you for writing Thanks. an important book. Thank you so much for many years of hard work on a very important topic yeah. close to my heart. And thank you for a great conversation, for uh, meeting with us and taking the time to share your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you thank so you much.